One of the great joys of the Christian life is that no matter our circumstances, we can echo with that song and say it's well with our soul. Thank you, Carolyn. Here in first through third grade, you can slip out at this time. The rest of us are turning to John chapter 5. John chapter 5. As the sides are so adequately said, we are looking at the last truly, truly this morning. Of the three statements that we've been looking at the last three weeks. John chapter 5, our passage begins in verse 25. The context looks all the way back to verse 18 with Christ making himself equal to the Father. Equal with the Father. Same essence. Expounding on that through these three truly, truly statements. Let's look together at verses 25 through 29 and then we'll pray. <clears throat> Christ says, Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. And he has given him authority to execute judgment, because he is the Son of Man. Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life, and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. God, as we look into your word this morning, would you give eyes that we may see and that we may understand the truth that you have for us. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. As a pastor, God has given me the incredible opportunity with our church family of being with them during specific times. And as we walk the road with you as pastors, there are great moments of excitement and great mountain peaks of highs, and there are deep valleys and lows. I had the privilege of performing weddings, of being in the hospital to see babies when they're just born, to pray with the parents and with the babies, as well as leading funerals. <clears throat> it's not uncommon that I find myself standing with one of our dear brothers or sisters behind or beside an open grave during the internment service or specifically following the service of a loved one. During these moments when you stand beside an open grave, it seems to mock you. As there's something about burying a body after death that just seems wrong, that something is incomplete, that if this truly is the end, if this is the last time that I'll see my loved one, that I'll see my, my spouse, or if this is the last time that I'll see my child or my parent, that life seems like a cruel joke. And that if this truly is the end, we are of all people most miserable. So our heart cries out in suffering with Job in Job chapter 14 when he says, If a man dies, will he live again? And in that portion of the book of Job, we're not quite sure of Job's answer to that question yet. Because in the throes of suffering, his heart is crying out for death. For surely, death would be better than living in this state. Friend, have you ever asked yourself the same question? I heard a man once say, who was rejecting Christianity, that when you die, you're just like an animal. You put, they put your body in the ground, and the lights are turned off, and that's it. And yet, there's something in our heart that says... Surely that can't be it. It can't be right. It's a conscience created in the image of God cries out for more. So maybe you've come this morning and you have that question on your heart. If a man dies, will he live again? I'd like to share with you this morning the comforting teaching of Scripture. Job, we find out just five chapters later, 
answers his own question. He says, for I know that my Redeemer lives, Job 19, and at the last he will stand upon the earth, and after my skin has thus been destroyed, yet in my flesh I will see God. As even Job embraces the wonderful truth of the resurrection. Paul says it to the church of Rome this way, if we've been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. And so our hope as believers is anchored in the truth of the bodily resurrection of every person. Jesus teaches us this in our passage. Truly, truly, he says, and as we mentioned last week, this truly, truly is not added to give any truth to a statement as though the statements before that aren't as true as this statement, to add any veracity to what he's saying, but instead he's drawing our, our attention specially to these statements, like a parent saying, pay attention, let me be honest with you about this, or let me be fully transparent, it's a statement that doesn't negate other statements, but draws our attention specifically to this. And what does he say in verse 25? The dead will hear the voice of the Son of God. In order to properly understand this passage, verses 25 through 29, we really need to put two statements together, one in, chapter 20, in verse 25 and one in verse 28. I'll read them back to back for you. Verse 25. The dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. And then down in verse 28. All who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out. That is the, the crux. That is the statement that, that Jesus wants us to see through the pen of John in these verses. And so what I'd like to show you this morning is that in verses 25 through 29, we have outlined for us that Jesus, as the Son of God, possesses the power to call the dead to life. That's what we have. The power of Jesus in being a life-giving power, a force, a strength, a deity, a life-giving deity. This passage first shows us this life-giving power through his voice. Look at verse 25. An hour is coming is now here when the dead will be made alive, but through what means? How will this happen? Through the voice of the Son of God. There's no question whether or not this person is dead. The word that's used to describe dead here is the word necros, where we get the word necromancer. Someone who interacts with those who are dead. If you, if you trace this word to the New Testament, you see that, interestingly enough, this word is used to talk about someone who possessed life and then died, to refer specifically to a dead and decaying body. I don't mean to be gross here, but, but then when you're referring to a, a decaying body, they would call that a dead body. But it's also used in referring to, to uh, items in which it is impossible for them to possess life. They would say these idols are dead idols. There's no spark of life in them. And so we would use this today to say, you know, we could say maybe a robot may be able to perform actions, but it is a dead, it is a dead robot. It possesses no spark of life. You may think that Siri actually is a living being as she listens to your every <coughs> single word, you know, or Alexa, whatever your, you know, affinity is there. But there's no life there. Whatever intelligence is there is still artificial. Because there is a spark, there is a breath of life that you have that a piece of technology, no matter how high the intelligence, does not have because that intelligence is still artificial. And so when we look at this word necros, that's what that means. It means absent of this breath of life that is present in a human being but is not present in a rock or even in a tree. There is a, a breath of life here. And when that breath of life is gone, you have necros, you have death. I don't know if you've ever seen someone take their last breath. 
or have you seen someone who has just died? But when you see someone take their last breath or you see that body that no longer has life, it is obvious that that body is missing something. That what was there is no longer there. absence of life. All of us have seen death on some level. If you've never seen someone pass from this life into the next physically, you've probably interacted at some point with some sort of animal that has died. Or, or something that had a breath of life in it that then it was gone. I had a dog that was funny story. Uh, it's not really funny because my dog died, but it's, it's, a little bit, it's, it's a little bit funny because uh, we got this dog from the pound. Some of you have heard the story before. We got this dog from the pound, and they told us when it was this little teeny tiny cute puppy that it was half, um, let's see here, it was half collie and half Labrador retriever, which would have made a, a wonderful dog. But when it grew up, we realized it was actually half Doberman and half Rottweiler. So it was very different genetics. And um, so my. My dad prayed, Lord, if this dog's going to be a problem in our neighborhood or with a family that's going to be dangerous, would you just take care of it? And then he left on a business trip. And, and that day, his prayer was answered out on Selenese Road in Rock Hill, South Carolina, as our dog at the end of her life, right? And my mom's response to that was, next time you pray that, make sure you're home to clean it up. Okay. Uh, but, um, but at that point, when, when you have something that is dead, it doesn't matter... Like, like, let's say that I, I, I was trying to, to, to get, you know, the, the body out of the road and traffic was really busy. It doesn't matter how long I call on the side of the road. You know, her name was Reese because she was brown and, and black. And so, come here, Reese, Come on, come on. You can do it. And maybe I get louder, right? And I yell at her. Or maybe I even go get the whistle that we were trying to train her with and blow that whistle really loud. That body is never going to move. Why? Because it does not possess life. But there is something fascinating in this verse that we need to recognize. Look at this phrase. The dead will hear. Isn't that interesting? The dead, those who possess no life, Will hear. And that brings us to a question. How do dead people hear? How did Lazarus hear Jesus? Should have thought about that. Like he's in the tomb. You say they roll away the stone. Yeah, but he's dead. And he's been in the tomb for days. So much so that the King James Version says he's stinking. It's one of my favorite King James words. Right? <laughs> yeah, don't do that. Don't roll back that stone, and yet Jesus stands outside the tomb, and he talks to a dead man. And he says, Lazarus, come forth. Because hearing, as we saw last week, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the what? By the word of God. So here's what you have to understand, friends, is that in order for a person to even have the ability to hear, it has to come by the power of God. The dead will hear. His voice is a life-giving voice. It's not just a summoning voice. Jesus didn't say, Lazarus, wake up! Lazarus, come out! His voice was the life-giving agent that was needed to say, Lazarus, come forth. Because it is the word of God that not only calls to repentance, but gives the very ability to hear. How do we know that? Mark chapter 4. Listen carefully. When he was alone, those around him and the twelve asked him about the parables. He said to them, to you has been given the secret to the kingdom of God, but for those outside, everything is given in parables. People think that Jesus spoke in parables just to tell stories or to give us illustrations, but that's not what Scripture says. Matthew 13, Mark chapter 4, parables are given to hide the truth from those who will not believe. So that, verse 12 of Mark chapter 4, 
the fulfillment of Isaiah chapter 6 would be true. Hearing, or they may indeed see, but they will not perceive or understand. They may indeed hear, they may, they may actually hear the sound of Jesus speaking, but they will not understand, lest they turn and be forgiven. So it is the very voice of God that is a life-giving voice that calls to repentance. So what happens to those who hear the word and turn in faith? Look down at verse 25. The dead will hear the life-giving voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. It's a promise. It's a promise. It's a statement of certainty. If you hear the voice of God, you respond in faith, and you will live. Those who do not hear do not live. Those who hear live, friend, it's a statement of certainty. When you call upon God through faith for salvation, it is a certain fact that you will live. The certainty of salvation. Matthew Henry, which is a great commentator, he wrote a couple hundred years ago, and so sometimes the, the verbiage is, is hard to read. You can usually find all of his works free of charge because they're in the public domain. Matthew Henry said the following, It's by the voice of the Son of God that souls are raised to spiritual life. It is wrought by His power, and that power is conveyed and communicated by His Word. The Word carries the power of God. The dead shall hear, shall be made to hear, to understand, receive, and believe the voice of the Son of God, to hear it as His voice, then the Spirit by it gives life, Otherwise, the law kills. So what he's saying is, without the voice of the Son of God, there is nothing but certain death. But through the power of the voice of God, there is life. And so what is the response of the unbeliever? Isaiah 55 and verse 3. Incline your ear and come to me. Hear that your soul may live. So friend, if you're here and you're not a Christian, and you have been... Sensing the drawing hand of God on your conscience, it feels as though somebody is just pulling you in. What do you do? Hear that you may live. Turn to Christ and find salvation. Because through the voice of Christ and the word of God, your soul has life. Hear that you may live. Trust him in faith. Stop trying to earn your own way to God and figure it out. Salvation is not complicated. Repent and believe the gospel. Amen. Find life through the voice of the Son of God. But there's something very interesting about this phrase. Look at the beginning of verse 25. The hour is coming and is now here. It's coming in the future, but it's also right now. It's coming, but it's also here. There's a phrase that you may want to write down, you may not want to write it down, you may not care, that's fine. But it's a phrase called realized eschatology. You may have heard it said this way. Already, but not yet. Already, but not yet. You've been saved, but you will be saved. You have Christ now, you will have Christ in the future. You have the righteousness of God now, you will have the righteousness of God in the future. It's this sense that you have eternal life, and one day you will have eternal life. That it's now, but it's also in the future. And there are some, there's some disagreements between theologians whether he's talking about the spiritual resurrection, which he's referring to in this first verse, not a physical resurrection, but a spiritual resurrection in verse 25, and whether that, that not yet is Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit comes down, or whether that is in the full bodily resurrection in the future. I think you can choose. I think they're, they're both really good options there. But the key point is that you are given eternal life at the moment that you turn to Christ in faith. And that eternal life is fully realized and entered into bodily and consummated when you take your last breath here on this earth and are entered into eternity. You could say it this way, we exist now in the time when those who are spiritually dead are being resurrected into spiritual eternal life. And the day is coming when all of those who are physically dead will be resurrected to physical life as well. 
It is an already not yet. It is a realized eschatology. And what you need to know is that your eternal life in the future is guaranteed by the eternal life you possess in the present. So his life-giving power is evidenced in his voice. It's also evidenced in his authority. Look at verse 26. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. And he has given him authority to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man. Now remember, this passage is given in the context of Jesus saying that I possess equality with the Father. That there is nothing about the essence of the Father that is also not, that is not true about the essence of the Son. That they share the same divine essence. On September 29th, 2011, I became a father. I remember that day, all of you who have children, remember that day when you are struck with a combination of the greatest love you've ever felt and the greatest fear you've ever felt. Holding that child and looking at the doctor and saying, is this really mine? You know? A couple days later, the doctor sending you home and you being scared to death that you're going to mess it up. Do you remember those days? I remember not wanting to leave the hospital because we had just gotten everything down and then they say, no, no, you have to go. You know? Let me ask you this question. What makes a father a father? What is it that makes a father a father? A man becomes a father when he gives his life to another. That we have four children, and each one of them has received their life partially from me as the father. And so what makes a father a father is that the life that he possesses is passed on to another. You ever wonder in the, in the I know we're getting a little bit in depth here, but it's very important you understand this as we go deep into Scripture. What makes the Father the Father and the Son the Son in the Trinity? Is that the Father possesses all life and the Son eternally receives that life from the Father. And no, we don't understand that, but we can, we can make truth statements when Jesus says, look down at verse 26, the Father has life in and of himself. It is the Father that possesses all life in that life. He has granted to the Son, not in a moment in time. As if there was a moment when the Son did not possess life and the moment when the Son does possess life, but as an eternal generation is the word we would use. Eternally generated from the Father. You may use the word begotten what the word begotten means. The only begotten Son of God. That does not mean that Jesus was at one point birthed into being. It means that he receives life from the Father. That's what makes the Son the Son and the Father the Father. And one day we will understand that. But right now we look at that and we don't understand it, but we believe it and so we worship. And we are blown away of the life of the Father and the Son. And what Jesus is saying with this one statement is that there's nothing about the Father's life that is not true about the Son. There's nothing. The Father is eternally generating the Son. Eternally begotten of the Father. The life of the Son is the life of the Father. He eternally gives that life. They share the same life, the same essence. There is no worship due the Father that is not also due the Son. And so you pray to the Father and you pray to the Son and you sing to the Father and you sing to the Son and you obey the Father and you obey the Son because He is truly God in every way. The Father's authority has been given to the Son. Not only his life, but his authority. His authority. Look down at verse 27. And he, the Father, has given him 
The Son, authority to execute judgment. His authority is a life-giving authority, meaning the Father eternally gives life to the Son, and the Father has given full authority to the Son because of that life. The authority of the Father is the authority of the Son. There is no authority that the Father possesses that the Son does not also possess. There is no determination or judgment that Jesus makes that is not a direct parallel to the Father. There is no will that the Son has that is not fully and completely also the will of the Father. Now, if you want to get really specific, there are some of you who are thinking about a verse in, in Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane where, where Jesus says, what phrase in thinking about the, the, the judgment that is to come on the cross for sin, Jesus says, Lord, if there, be, if there be any way, if there's any possibility, let this cup pass from me, right? Is there any other way to accomplish redemption than the way that you have, have ordained through the suffering of the cross? Is there any other way? And he ends with what statement? Not my will, but yours be done. And you say, how can Jesus have the same will of the Father and yet call his will into submission of the Father because... Jesus was both God and man. And in his divine nature, his will was never separate from the Father and did not need to be in alignment, called into alignment with the Father. But what Jesus is doing is he's taking his human nature and he's aligning it under the Father's will at every point in life. And you say, why is that important? Because that's what God calls you to do. God calls you to align your human will to the will of the Father. That your prayer would be just like Jesus's. God, if there's any other way, let it be so. God, this is, this seems like it's too heavy to bear. Would you remove this burden? Would you heal this sickness? Whatever it would be. But it's always ended with, God, not my will, but yours be done. As we align our human will under the Father. But in Jesus' divine nature as the Son of God, in His divine will, there is no difference. You could say it this way. We don't have a schizophrenic trinity, right? Where we have the Son wanting one thing and the Father wanting something else. That they are one in the same in their actions and in their will. And there is a reason why this is the case. He gives a because statement. Look at the end of verse 27. Because he, Jesus, is the son, and you would expect him to say the son of God. But that's not what he says. He says Jesus is the son of man. There would be some that would suggest that what Jesus is referring to in this statement is that he possesses all humanity, true humanity, and although that is a correct statement, that's not what this is referring to. This is a title. And this title draws us back to Daniel chapter 7. And for, for the sake of time and for continuity, we won't turn there. But I'd like you to write this down or log it in your brain. I'm going to read it for you. Very important passage. Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. Daniel begins the prophetic second half of his book. And here is what he sees. I saw... In the night visions. And behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like the Son of Man, a title, one like the Son of Man. And he came to the Ancient of Days, that's the Father, and he was presented before the Father. Daniel is getting this vision of the ascension of Christ. You say, why is the ascension of Christ important? Do you know what happened after? Jesus left the disciples, remember, and the angel says, why are you guys staring up into heaven? You want to know what happened? This is what happened. Daniel chapter 7, 13 and 14. And to him, the Son of Man, Jesus, was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples and nations and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. And what Jesus is doing to those Jewish people who knew their Old Testament is he's drawing their minds back to Daniel chapter 7. And he's saying, remember the Son of Man? Do you remember the one 
who arises to the Ancient of Days and is equal with God because all nations worship him and he's given judgment, that's me. That's what Jesus is saying. That's me. He's calling them to believe. Remember, he's, if you back up in verse 18, this is why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him. Because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but what? He was calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. And Jesus is saying, do you know why all judgment is reserved for me? Do you know why I have the right, the authority to execute judgment? Because I'm the son of man. I am the one who possesses all deity. I am the one to whom all should worship. He is worthy of worship. He possesses an everlasting kingdom. This passage tells us that Jesus gives life through his voice. He gives life through his authority. And he gives life even through his judgment. Look at verse 28. Do not marvel at this. I mean, you can imagine, uh, we can't really, as, as 21st century Americans, understand the, the weight of what Jesus was saying. And he says, in essence, you think, that's amazing. Listen to this. You think that's good. <clears throat> Listen to what I'm about to say. In our is coming. Notice he does not say an hour is now here. That was given for the spiritual resurrection of calling dead souls to life and salvation. He says the hour is coming. This is something happening in the future. A resurrection in the future. What is coming? Verse 28. When all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out. If you have any question whether or not he's talking about dead people, he just answered your question. All of those who are in the tombs will come out. There is coming a day when every grave will burst open, when the sea will give up her dead. There is coming a day when every dead body will be called to life. And John splits them up through the words of Christ. Jesus gives us two categories of people who will be resurrected. He says those who have done good and those who have done evil. Literally, those whose lives have been characterized by good actions and those whose lives have been characterized by wicked deeds. That's what he's saying here. Now, when we look at the teachings of Scripture, we know what this does not mean. This does not mean that you can earn one of these two resurrections by good deeds or wicked deeds. That is not what he's saying here. We know that clearly through the rest of Scripture that salvation is by grace through faith in Christ alone. So we really have two options. We have two options here. What he means by good, those who've done good, those who've done evil. The first option is referring to the works that follow belief or unbelief. Believers who have a life that reflects their belief system. If you genuinely believe the truth about God, if you have bowed your knee to Jesus as your Lord, your life will change. That doesn't mean you're perfect. But it means your life will change. You can't believe something and not act like that's true. Because if you act like it's not true, you don't really believe it. So there's no such thing as a faith that doesn't change people. Evidenced by good works, James chapter 2. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. What does he say? Show me your dead faith without your works. I will show you my faith by my works. I will evidence my faith by my works. And so we see people in Scripture who are believers, but the Bible never says this person is regenerate. They just show you the works of their life. And I'll give you one illustration. Acts chapter 9, verse 36. There's a woman named Tabitha, whose name was also Dorcas. She was full of good works and acts of charity. That's Luke's way in the book of Acts of saying she's a Christian. Now, her good works and acts of charity didn't make her a Christian. But it's Luke's way of cluing us in 
that this person was a genuine believer. Tabitha was a believer, Acts 9.36. Why is that important? Well, because in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10, we are created in Christ Jesus unto good works. So the first option that you can hold here is that those who have done good refers to lives that have reflect genuine, genuine belief and genuine faith. I think it's a good option here. A poor option would be your works earned you a good resurrection, your works earned you an evil resurrection. We can clearly say that that's not the truth. And so the first good option is that the works that are here following the belief, evidencing the belief. Second good option is this. This could be referring to the first good work that any believer participates in. And that is the good work of believing the Father. John chapter 6. What must we do to be doing the works of God? Verse 29 of John 6. We'll get to this in a, in a couple weeks. Jesus answered them, This is the work of God that you believe in him whom he sent. This is God's work in your heart and also your work. Believe in Jesus. Believe the truth. Believe the truth. 1 John chapter 3, verse 23. This is his commandment, that we believe in the name of the Son, Jesus Christ. This is his command. This is the commandment for the unbeliever. Believe. Believe. What must I do to be saved? Believe. Turn from your sin. Turn to Jesus and believe in God. Believe in Jesus Christ. It is a person's unbelief that sends them to hell. It is a person's belief that grants them access into heaven. Believing in the Father. Either one of those are good options, but I think we need to take just a brief moment and we need to ask the question, try to kind of weave these in whenever they come up, questions that you have about aspects of theology. I think this is a good question that you probably didn't even know that you had. Okay? What is a good work? It's a good question, right? What is a good work? Because Ephesians 2.10 says that we are saved for the purpose of doing good works. We need to know what a good work is, don't we? What is a good work? Well, the first thing we need to understand about good works is that unbelievers are incapable of good works. So whatever it is, it's something that unbelievers are incapable of doing. I'll give you three verses. Proverbs 21.4, haughty eyes and a proud heart, the lamp, or some translations say light, some translations say the plowing of the wicked is sin. So any goodness, any light, any lamp, any goodness that a believer will participate in is still sin. Okay? That's the first note that we need to understand. Proverbs 15.8, the sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord. The sacrifice of Cain was refused. The sacrifice of Abel was accepted. Even the, the sacrifices of an unrighteous person is an abomination to the Lord. But the prayer of the upright is acceptable to him. So here in Hebrew poetry, in Proverbs 15, verse 8, we have two acts of worship. And the only thing that's different is the person is either unrighteous or righteous. And so we find the conclusion given to us in Romans 14 and verse 23. And Paul gives us the conclusion of what makes a good work a good work. And here's what it is. Romans 14, 23. For whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. What is the difference between a moral act of an unbeliever and that same moral act to the glory of God and the believer. What is the difference? What is a good work? What is sin? What is the difference, friend? It's faith. When you, in faith, live out your life in obedience to God, you are performing good works. When an unbeliever trying to earn his own righteousness does those same actions, he is living in sin. And so there is nothing that an unbeliever can do that God says is good. 
What does not proceed from faith is sin. So what is your action as a believer? Friend, live in faith. Live in faith, obeying God. If you want a, a sister verse to Romans chapter 14 and Hebrews chapter 11, without faith, it is impossible to please Him. It is the presence of faith that turns a self-righteous, sinful act into a work that is pleasing to God. That's what a good work is. I think we need to rec recognize in this passage that all are to be resurrected. At the end of verse 29, all are to be resurrected. Believers to life and unbelievers to death. And the only reason that believers are resurrected to life is because Jesus died in your place. All are resurrected to judgment. The judgment that is exercised on unbelievers is a judgment to death. The judgment that is exercised to believers is cloaked by Jesus. It is absorbed by Jesus. The judgment is still there, but Jesus takes that judgment for you. And thus that judgment, because of the sacrifice of Christ, is a judgment to you of life. And so you are wrapped in the white robe of Christ's white robe of righteousness. And Jesus is your judgment. And so the judgment that is offered is actually a judgment of life. It is a life-giving judgment through Jesus. What benefit does believing what I just told you have? The, the doctrine of the bodily resurrection. You can put it this way. How important is it that we believe in a, in a bodily resurrection? And what implications does that have in my life? What I'd like to do is spend the last few brief moments that we have, and I would like to give you some implications of a bodily resurrection. And here's what, I'd like, here's what I'd like to prove to you in this moment. Is that we believe the doctrines of Scripture for a reason, and they have long-lasting implications. That the truth that we believe is not a dry, dusty truth that sits on a shelf. The truth that we believe works, and it's applicable. And I want to give you, I have, I have five written down. I want to give you briefly all five. Because of the bodily resurrection, number one, heaven is a physical place. Heaven is a physical place. Because right now in heaven, you have countless spiritual beings, but you have one resurrected physical man. Heaven is a physical place. Jesus as a resurrected human, is right now seated in heaven at the right hand of the Father, making intercession for you. You say, where is heaven? I have no idea. And anybody that tells you where it is doesn't know either, okay? But it's a physical place. God intends that you, as a believer, as his child, will physically live with him for all of eternity. That's why it says that you live in God's house. Because God is going to live with you as a believer for all eternity, physically. We're not going to be some disembodied spirits floating around the clouds somewhere. You will be physically with God. You're not going to be some baby playing a harp, <laughs> sitting on a cloud with some embarrassing outfit. Right? No. You will physically be with God because your body will be physically resurrected. This means that you will physically live forever either in the new heavens and the new earth or you will physically live forever in hell. Physically. This is not that there would be some who would perhaps in their attempts to show a a more palatable God describe hell as spiritual torment, and surely it will be that. But make no mistake, friends, hell will be filled with physical beings. 
in physical distress and in physical torment. For there is a bodily resurrection. As finite creatures, we cannot comprehend what living in an endless succession of events will be like. But I know that it's true. Because heaven is a physical place where you will physically live. You say, what about before the resurrection? Well, I believe that every believer will possess a temporary body in heaven. And that full physical body, or I should say full, it's a full temporal body, your physical body is waiting for you in the dust of the earth and will be called forth in the resurrection. Secondly, let me tell you why this doctrine is so important. Let me have a little pastoral moment here. When we see sinful madness happening around us, you need to know two things. Number one, nothing is new. So it's happened in church history before, so that needs to be someplace we need to look. How did, how did God's people respond to this in the past? Not always where we want to land, but that gives us a good start. Secondly, the Bible deals with it somewhere. So listen to this second implication. Very important. God, it be, because there is a bodily resurrection, God intends the immaterial part of man and the material, the material part of man to exist in perfect harmony for all of eternity. You say, that's, that's a mouthful. What do you mean by that? It means that each individual person will have an individual resurrected body that God originally gave them, and each person will exist in that body for all of eternity. So you will have your resurrected body. For some of you, you're like, yay. For some of you, are like, stink. Right? <laughs> you will have your resurrected body. And in our world today, some people have bought into the lie that somehow who I am in the immaterial side, in my thoughts, in my processes, in my desires, can exist at odds with who I am physically. For instance, I can be one person on the inside and another person on the outside. The real me is who I am in my feelings, and this feeling goes against my physical being. The physical is wrong, and the immaterial is right, and so you may hear these wrong statements in something like this. My identities are at odds with each other. My physical body is wrong. It needs to be brought into alignment with my inner person. I am a mistake. To say it bluntly, the lie would be I am a girl trapped in a boy's body or a boy trapped in a girl's body. Or even today, I'm some sort of animal trapped in a human body. And the doctrine of the bodily resurrection blows that out of the water. Because God has existed. God has planned that you would exist as a person, who you are, for all of eternity. We don't need some psychologist to tell us that, friends. We have the Bible. This is why doctrine matters. And you say, why do you go into all these details? Because this is what keeps us centered. This is where we live. Your material and immaterial self cannot be at odds with each other. You may think they are at odds with each other, but that is the result of the fall. It is not truth. Each person will be physically resurrected in the body that God originally gave them. And that person will exist in that glorified body for all of eternity. Is the bodily resurrection important? Yes, it's important. Number three, I'll go quickly. Friend, in order to feel the joy of the resurrection, we must first feel the pain and sorrow of death. So many of us, we want the end result without going through the process, don't we? And when we read my outer self is wasting away, many of you would say, Amen. It's me. 
my eyesight, my, my joints, my back, my mind. It's wasting away. But we cannot feel the joy of resurrection without first feeling the pain and sorrow of death. For it is the pain and sorrow of death that makes that resurrection that much sweeter. You know why some of you don't long for heaven? is because you don't realize how bad this earth actually is. I remember thinking as a, as a child, Lord Jesus, come after, right? And then I fill in the blank depending on what phase of life I was in. Come after my baseball game, please. <laughs> come after I can find true love. And then at eight years old, when my heart was broken, Lord Jesus, come now. You know? <laughs> if you could just, uh, Jesus, wait till after I'm married, or wait till after I have kids, or wait till after I have grandkids, whatever it would be. But the resurrection reminds us that the joy of heaven is, is made so much more beautiful by the sufferings of this earth. Hebrews 12, 2, looking to Jesus as our example, the founder, perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, what? Endured the cross, despising the shame, and is now seated at the right hand of God. So friend, endure the sorrow, for the glory that is awaiting you is beyond any suffering you could ever endure. Number four, your body is precious to God. God doesn't just care about your spiritual. God cares about your physical as well. Your body is precious to God. He created it. He owns it. Your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. You were bought with a price. It's not your body, your choice. It's his body, his choice. Amen. And I'm not just making that statement about abortion Christ. There are some Christians who would be pro-life and anti-abortion, but in their actions would still claim my body, my choice. You know what it looks like? Your 16-year-old comes to you and says she wants to go to the mission field, and what do you say? Are you sure you just don't want to be a nurse? I believe God's calling me to, to serve in the Middle East in a war-torn country in which I will give my life and those around me say are you sure because it's really dangerous friends our body does not belong to us it was given to us to steward by god and the implications of that are massive when it comes to Shepherding and caring for the one body that God has given us while we have the chance. To willingly sacrificing it for the gospel. He owns it. And you're just a steward. And one day you will have to give an account because it's precious to him. Lastly. Judgment day is coming. Judgment day is coming. Not some spiritual, esoteric day, but a physical day when you physically will kneel before the God of the universe and you will be called into account and the judgment of God will descend on you. And either that judgment will be absorbed by Christ or you will be physically under the judgment of God for all of eternity. If you're here and you're not a Christian, your heart should be drawn to the point of saying, Pastor, I don't want that to be me. What do I do? And so hear the words of the prophet Isaiah. Come to me, says God. Hear that your soul may live. So would you turn to Jesus? So that day of judgment is a judgment of life not a judgment to death. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for the truth of the bodily resurrection.
So thankful that in these moments we can meditate on the fact that our beliefs do drive our actions. And maybe there's one here this morning who has been motivated to righteousness because of the truth of the bodily resurrection of believers. And the bodily resurrection of unbelievers. May our love for this fallen world drive us to give the gospel clearly. May our love for you drive us to live in a way that is holy. And may the truth of the bodily resurrection of every person drive us to our knees in worship and to our feet in good works, living by faith.